Welcome to part two of our overview of the EMEA market. When we last left off, we were discussing some of the high-level information about the European, Middle East, and Africa markets with Saif Sharawi and Pietro Landoni from Bostic. They had already touched on demographics, incomes, birth rates, and population growth in the different subregions, and what some of the current consumer preferences look like. With the information they shared, it became very apparent how diverse those submarkets are and how challenging it could be for producers to meet those varying needs. Luckily, Bostic is here to help. Welcome to Attached to Hygiene. I'm your host, Jack Hughes, Global Digital Marketing Manager for Bostic's Disposable Hygiene Business Unit. On every episode of Attached to Hygiene, Bostic and other industry experts provide valuable insight into market and consumer trends in the disposable hygiene industry and how article producers like you can increase their success and reach their business goals. On today's episode, we're going to dive deeper into the European, Middle East, and Africa markets. We'll cover changes in the market from the producer and supplier side, the challenges producers are facing, a few of the five C's or consumer trends that are impacting the market, and then wrap up by touching on the topic of sustainability. So with all that in mind, with the, the changes in demographics and growth in disposable income and birth rates declining, aging population, and the, some of the trends in user habits, what is, what is the result of this? How is this impacting the market and, and causing it to change? And, and Pietro, we'll start with you. Well, one clear trend uh, or dynamic that we see in, uh, in the market is uh, commoditization. We see that it's more and more difficult in our market to differentiate from competition. And this point concerns uh, not only the finished product, but uh, it's also the raw materials. And, but for our customer, it's really a big issue to differentiate their, themselves vis-a-vis -vis consumers. Um, the, the, the key point is, uh, refer to what I mentioned before on the, the fact that private labor are getting very, very successful in, uh, in the market. The key point is that consumers are less concerned than what they used to be in the past to try new products and to compare new products. And so finally, they come sometimes with the decision to say, I'm not ready to pay more for something which is actually, you know, acting or performing the same of a cheaper option. So, uh, and they go for the cheaper option. That is something definitely that we see in the market. We see expansion, expansion in the uh, emerging market. So that's not definitely a trend that we see in Europe, but uh, mostly in, uh, in, in Africa. But we see definitely a consolidation of companies. There might be different reasons behind that. You know, I mentioned one, which is commoditization, market share shrinking, definitely competition coming from uh, outside the region, different business models. So all these things are somehow obliged companies to look into uh, alternatives because uh, that's the only way to survive healthily in this market. But I think that this is something that it will come more and more. It's a way to have a market uh, more balanced and, uh, and healthy. Clearly, there are different dynamics between even here, between uh, Europe and uh, Middle East and Africa. We, we talked about private label and, and, uh, and store brands. And it's, as I mentioned before, so far, it seems that, you know, statistics are speaking in favor of uh, private label for uh, different reasons. And concerning uh, also the uh, potential for new entrants in our field, that is something which is not happening often in our in our market and the reason are different so uh, definitely barriers related to the uh, financial effort investments that are needed to enter the markets uh, to uh, technical operational and market knowledge so it's it's not market where typically you see a lot of new engines uh, but having said that we definitely have example uh, in uh, in Europe, but most of the new entrants are definitely in the Middle East and uh, Africa region. So Pietro, I wouldn't agree more, to be honest, especially on uh, commodita commoditization. I, I believe it started in our region. So it, it's happening and you can see huge pressure on the buyer and on the consumer, huge pressure on the cost. And it's becoming, uh, we hear more and more the word good enough and the value for money. And it's as well linked with the millennials becoming new parents 
as I said, they are more uh, skeptical about brands. They question lots of things and they look for value for money. We can see private labels winning a lot. You can see uh, the retail brands uh, everywhere offering good solutions uh, with good value for money. And we can see the big players or the global producer trying to compete, but they are not winning for sure uh, in, in the market. So it's a tough situation uh, uh, for sure. New capacities are coming mainly in Africa. So we have we see new players starting their activity in the last few years. We see a reduction in the newcomers in Turkey, for example, where competition is very hard at the moment and capacity is available. But Africa, as I mentioned, is a target market. And, and, and therefore, cost, technical performance, supply chain, and logistics are now key drivers for success in that region. And uh, knowing for sure that there are some other challenges to grow in, uh, in, in Africa, like the cash flow, like the system banking, and the working capital, for sure. But in, in general, if you want to summarize the situation about the market now, it's, it's the private label winning, the global producing trying to see how to differentiate and to educate the consumer to switch to, to different solutions, and the millennials stepping in, having more questions. They don't take anything for granted. They care about the environment, and therefore, new initiatives start to become uh, to come on the surface uh, in our region. It certainly sounds like that you know the the market overall, and and we can see this, but the market overall is very challenging for producers. Then, whether you're a global producer, as you mentioned, safe and you know struggling to get into a specific region or even a specific country or uh, a regional or local producer having to deal with commoditization or, or increased competition or or just you know the overall expectations of the market. It definitely sounds like a challenge. So diving deeper into the, the challenges for the producers and their suppliers like Bostic, what are some of the challenges stemming from all these changes um, and, and the overall fluctuations in the market? Well, as, as usual, the, uh, you know, the first challenge for each and every company is how to grow. And um, how to grow in a sustainable and a healthy way. And as mentioned before, we cannot act in our market if commoditization uh, did not happen. It happened and it's uh, here to stay. It's clear that everyone has to keep this in mind and uh, when planning the future and innovation in general, doing this, uh, having the right mix between uh, you know, commodities and high value products. At the same time, uh, particularly for Europe, uh, something that definitely have to keep in mind is the impact on the regulations. You know, there are more and more requests that are coming from the, from the consumer or from uh, the association of consumers that can uh, influence the decision at the EU level. So there, there is more need for certifications, labeling, uh, tests at outside laboratories. So this is definitely a challenge, but it's also a way to differentiate ourselves. But all this is, is somehow impacting the profitability of a business, you know, on one side, the pressure from commoditization, on the other side, the request for a, a additional testing, respect of regulation, certification, so more resources uh, to invest. So we see that in general, producers are struggling in the market on baby care, doing um, okay on fem care and, and doing pretty well on other Tinko where the market is definitely growing. Uh, apart from 2020, which was a very difficult year for, for many, many producers with a, a non-even distribution of the volume. First half, uh, very difficult to manage due to the panic buying and the second half, a bit quiet, followed by the, by the uh, stiff raw material uh, price increase and the issue with the freights uh, around the globe. All these will have to demonstrate how we are able to uh, live in a, in a world post-COVID with the new normal uh, that uh, it's here in, a, in our life. Delays in, uh, in getting supplied, uh, problems to keep uh, operation on track. So uh, a lot of new things that we had to learn the hard way in 2020 and that we have to uh, convert into opportunities uh, for all of us. Yeah, I can only echo what you said, because whether, whether you're in Middle East Africa or in Europe, I get the main challenge, the, the challenge is the same. How to grow top line, bottom line, how to stay profitable, how to manage your cash flow, how to ensure your collection. So to mitigate the risk you have. And as I mentioned, good enough products are winning in the market and uh, companies need to keep investing with all those challenges. You need to keep investing in innovation 
and uh, in in R and D to to keep creating value value for the for your consumer. Otherwise, you only lose you lose share and you lose uh, uh, profitability. So looking to regulations, the only difference here that we we see the trend coming. It's happening first in the mature market and then it's it's following in our emerging geographies. So we can see uh, a gap of three to five years before the regulation topic could rise to the surface. But the pressure on profitability, the pressure on management of cash, the raw material cost increasing, and the crisis we're seeing in the freight and being a responsible supplier, you need to ensure the continuity of supply, mean that you have to bear all that cost and still deliver uh, your solution to your customer to make sure that you satisfy the end consumer. So it, it's tough. 2020 was tough for sure, specifically with the turbulence in, uh, in buying behavior because of the COVID situation. I hope 2021 situation will, uh, will smooth a little bit, but the freight uh, crisis is not, uh, is not making things uh, more simple. It's a tough period actually for, for, for the producers for sure and uh, for the market in general and the industry. Couldn't agree more. It's, uh, I think everyone hoped after, as you said, kind of the volatility of 2020, that 2021 might be a, a bit of an easier year. But with all of the like kind of black swan weather events, the the blockage in the Suez Canal, all that stuff, the, the raw material situation and the shipping situation has not made things easier in 2021 for, for suppliers and for producers. And yeah, we can only hope it gets a little easier as the rest of 21, 2021 continues and, and into 2022, but definitely a challenging market right now. Now, I, I want to touch on some of the consumer needs in the market as we come to the end here. Bostic always likes to, you know, anyone who's listened to the podcast before will know that we break our consumer needs and the market trends down into five different categories, what we call our five C's. And those are convenience, comfort, confidence, consistency, and cost. And I want to touch on a few of those for each of the regions. And we'll, we'll start with convenience and Pietro, can you tell us a little bit about the the needs and the trends around convenience for the European market? Yeah, sure. So there are there are some clear trends that we see in the European markets. One of them is the growth in uh, in pants. This goes back with the uh, decision from BMG to uh, boost production and sales of baby pants in, in our region, uh, and followed by investment, uh, significant investment from almost all, uh, each and every player. And so this this is a growth uh, which we do not see only in baby, but uh, also in adult inco, inco pants uh, with a lot of new machines uh, that came on stream in the last uh, five to six years. Uh, another clear trend, uh, which is probably still at the early days, but it's 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 quite an important one, is the one related to uh, indicators and sensors. So th those are uh, used both in uh, baby care and in adult Kinko. There are some clear advantages in adult Inco, you know, uh, with those sensors that are connected to the um, uh, directly to the computer, where the the caregiver can clearly see uh, the patients who need to be changed. So uh, that is it's a clear advantage. Personally, 100% sure about the, uh, the need when it comes to the uh, user sensor on uh, baby diapers. But as Safe uh, mentioned before, this is the world of millennial. That is, uh, that is definitely a need that the, uh, you know, our, our customers, so the, the producer, will, uh, will have to answer to. I mentioned before about uh, e-commerce, and and this is definitely a growing trend. It's it's a growing trend not only in uh, baby diapers, but also in adult income, where people can easily order online and get delivered at home with uh, all of their need. Not only we you know with the with the diaper, but also with cream, lotions, and everything. So it's a it's a real 360 degree service that companies can offer to their customers. So those are clear trends that are present in the European uh, in the European market. So if you look to Middle East and Africa, I would say regarding convenience, what do you really need? You need the product to be available, to be simple in usage and to be, uh, to be safe in usage for sure. And to comment, as I mentioned before, there is a gap between three to five years between what the trend happening in Europe and then starting seeing this trend in uh, Middle East and Africa. For the growth in pants, we see it Although it's not yet really happening, 
So the global brands are trying to differentiate from regional and local competition by uh, introducing more and more the pants. They are trying to shift the consumer behavior uh, to be able to orient them toward the pants versus the classic type of diaper. So as I mentioned, this is still work in progress in our uh, in, in our region. And we can see now in, in, in the retails that the gap in price between the pants and the classic diaper is, is reducing uh, significantly. E-commerce for sure continue to grow, as we discussed before, in all the segments. In general, if you look to other incontinence in, in our region, it's, it's not that frequent that it's it being used unless for medical reasons. So in general, uh, as I mentioned, elder generation stay at home. They are being took care by the family members. Uh, in general, people in our region prefer to buy all their needs from one place. And this is why we see a big expansion in the business of the hypermarkets where you have the retail brands and the, the global brands, everything in one place in a big shelf. And, and that's why we see more and more importance on the packaging now, because you can easily identify your product among a big shelf full of articles. We also see that the big sizes are becoming more and more frequent uh, or more and more familiar now with more than 80 articles per bag. Uh, and that's now more and more convenient for the end user in our region. In other parts of the regions, because you know it's, it's very diverse, you can see behavior of people buying a diaper one by one. So you can see the two extreme parts of, uh, of the story. But at the end, it's all driven by how diverse is the region. That certainly sounds like a challenge for meeting the needs of convenience when, when some people want 80 diapers in a package and some people want one or two in a package. It has to be very challenging for producers. I mean, it makes sense. You know, it makes perfect sense, but it also makes sense that that you see such a, you know, these more regional or local players, particularly in the Middle East and Africa, because, you know, the user needs across countries are so diverse. The other C of the five C's that, that I want to ask about on the EMEA region is confidence. So, Pietro, again, we'll start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the need of confidence and some of the trends in that area that are, are leading to change in the market? Yeah, sure. So um, one thing that we are confronted uh, more and more each and every day is uh, with odor. So uh, there is a clear in, uh, demand for or no odor in our region, which doesn't mean, you know, um, that you have something to, has, uh, to have perfume in it. It's really no odor at all. And the reason is, it goes back to what I mentioned also before, that there is a, uh, also a need for an increasing uh, an increasing need to respect regulation, uh, certification, and also clearly to the fact that the perception of the consumer is that no odor, it means no chemical, and uh, and that is good. So odor is definitely a big watch out for us. Skin sensitiveness, this is also a, a very important point. It's, it's nothing new. It has always been like that in, in this field, uh, and it's really a, a very... Um, fundamental and, and basic requests for absorbent products. We mentioned before environment. So products should be uh, environment friendly. And, and this is again, clear trend throughout Europe. Uh, everybody pays more attention on, on what they buy. And uh, it's not only about uh, only the product itself and the components of the product. It's also about the, the, the packaging itself. We mentioned before the impact of millennial, and this is definitely driven the demand, but it's it's getting spread all over uh, different ages of the population. And this is also, you know, to uh, to be considered clearly when when we talk about uh, eco labeling, uh, there is um, an increasing demand from our customers related to uh, eco labeling. There are many that are uh, active in Europe, and we have to uh, uh, consider this when when working on our innovation, but also when uh, working on the on products that are on the shelf since uh, quite some time. So that that it's uh, also a very important uh, point for us. Even related to uh, the CSR and in general to the uh, environment, uh, it's the, uh, the thickness of the product. The need to have different kind of cores. You know, uh, we all know very well that we move from a very thick diaper to very thin diaper, uh, that we move to uh, core channels, uh, that you know, you can have more diaper per bag or a bag that are smaller. So. Uh, Basically, we are able to move more diapers on the same track. So everything is going into a uh, direction of environment. 
those are clear trends and clear needs that uh, each and every producer has to address in Europe to be successful. Yes, I agree with you, Pietro. So even in uh, Middle East and Africa, the basic needs are the same. So product should not leak. It should fit and stay in place. It should have no odor. So odor is a, is a hot topic in our region as well. And it's very visible. And no odor is the perception for sure. Although some perfumes and herbal extract are still acceptable to mask the chemical odor. Skin sensitivity, there is no doubt. This is not a, it, it, it goes without saying. Uh, to have the, no noise, so the product should be quiet, should be safe to use, and environmental. So we hear a lot more and more now about environmental friendly. So it's a concept that is rising in our region, especially with the younger generation. I would say it's not yet at the level where the buyer would pay premium for that. But as I said, we always see a gap of three to five years between the trends in, in, in Europe and Middle East and Africa. So I'm sure like regulation will come and then the environmental friendly product will, will be more and more um, familiar in, in, in our region. Thickness, that's mainly uh, one of the differences we have. So although I agree on all the advantages of the SIN products with the new core designs, it's, it's not really affecting the performance. Still, in our region, the perception is still that the thicker Pro product is still more comfortable, safer to use, and will have a higher performance. And I'm sure this will change with time, but it's, we're not there yet. Now, each of you mentioned sustainability and multiple answers. And so we only have a couple of minutes left here, but I want to dive a little deeper if we've got a little time into sustainability. So what does this look like across the region for, for Europe and the Middle East and Africa? And, and what are some of the, the differences across the regions? Well, as I mentioned already, uh, this is a real hot topic in Europe. There is uh, more and more focus on, uh, on how we can positively impact the, the environment for ourselves and for, uh, for the future generation, particularly, you know. And we all know that, uh, <laughs> in general, diapers, they don't have a, a good reputation when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, em uh, environment uh, preservation. There is a lot we can do, and uh, a lot of producers started uh, investing heavily in this direction. I mentioned before, not only on, on the product itself, but also on the packaging. Uh, there are products out there that instead of being packed on, um, on plastic film are packed on, uh, on paper. Films that are used uh, to pack diapers are uh, with higher percentages of uh, biomass raw material. Uh, the direction is um, basically to go more and more to product that can be recyclable or uh, eventually compostable. Every producer has, uh, of course, uh, a different strategy in that direction. Um, but it, it's, it's clear that uh, not all the raw material that can be used can have a natural origin. And not all the raw material can be recycled after use. At the same time, not all the raw materials or not uh, every finished product can be compostable. I think that at the end of the day, it's, uh, it is something that we speak about since many, many, many years. But the steps that have been taken in the last uh, two or three years are very, very significant. There is still a long way to go to make our mind up between, uh, as I mentioned, compostability, recyclability, bio origin of raw material, biomass, and so on and so far. But it's clearly, it's clearly a dynamic which is uh, part of a market and uh, everybody is now willing to invest time and money because uh, so far everything related to uh, this topic is much more expensive raw material, more expensive than, let's say, the standard one. But uh, it's good that the trend is there and uh, people start to look into this also as a business opportunity and not only as a problem to solve. Yes, I fully agree with you, Pietro. So taking a step back in our region, recycling is being more and more visible, even in our daily life. And it's mainly driven by the young generation. So segregation of waste is something that we're seeing more and more now. And uh, as you mentioned, people are also seeing the economic feedback on that. And this is why we see several new startups now in the recycling, uh, in the recycling business. And to add one final comment, the good thing in our region as well, that we start seeing the global producers, so not only in the hygiene sector, but in, in general, fulfilling their corporate social responsibilities. So they are now investing uh, in capex and solutions that will enable them to be more sustainable. Shareholders for sure are expecting a return 
of uh, on this investment this will happen for sure so we're not there yet i cannot say that you can see an immediate return of this investment but um, this is what we will see in the near future and it's good to see that uh, res responsible companies are fulfilling their roles here even in our region I, I could not agree more. It's safe. You said we're we're not there yet. Agree with that. But it is good to see that there's momentum, that there is a, a push from the market, from from consumers to to reach a point of of having sustainable products or recyclable products. And obviously, Pietro, you mentioned there there's a challenge around. Okay, what it, what is the the way we want to go? What is um you know do, do we want to focus on compostable? Do we focus on recyclable? Do we focus on bio based? That is certainly a challenge in the market right now. But it's it's good to see that there's momentum. It's good to see that there's investment. And I hope that it not only continues but also accelerates to the point that you know we can get there in short time. So we're at the end of our time here. I I really want to thank each of you, Safe and Pietro, for diving deeper into the this this very diverse, this very big, um, and this very changing market of, uh, the, of Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. So thank you very much for your time, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jack, for inviting us. Thank you, Jack. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode. In the coming weeks, we'll dive deeper into some of the other regions that Bostic works and operates in with other regional experts from within Bostic. Attached to Hygiene is brought to you by Bostic and is hosted by me, Jack Hughes. It is produced and edited by me with the help of Paul Andrews, Michelle Tonkovitz, Emery Chernis, and Nikki Ackerman at Green Onion Creative. Our theme music is by Jonathan Boyle. You can follow Bostic for more hygiene industry insights on LinkedIn at Disposable Hygiene Adhesives or email us with questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes at hygiene at Bostic.com. That's H Y G I. E-N-E at Bostic.com. We'd also like to extend a special thank you to our guests, Safe Sharawi and Pietro Landoni. You can find both Safe and Pietro on LinkedIn, or you can feel free to address any emails to them directly at the hygiene at Bostic.com email address I just mentioned. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe to the podcast and share us with a friend or colleague. You can find Attached to Hygiene wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.